Good afternoon, you way bastards, and welcome back to War Thunder with Koala. And today we're continuing our series on potential light tank, scout tank, and armored car additions to the game with the American Tech Tree. There are a whole bunch of vehicles I want to go over today, including quite a few models of tanks with unmanned or telescopic turrets. Before we get started, I know the whole stop adding new vehicles and fix the game in 1.91 is a big thing now. I'm going to talk about this very soon. But we're doing this video as a fun hypothetical right now, and I want you guys to know that I'm not actually suggesting that Gaijin needs to add the following vehicles, especially not at the expense of fixing the game first. This is just a fun what if, and I want to get this series finished. First though, I want to shout out something I've been exceedingly excited about over the past few days, and that is my new merch store. I said that we'd do merchandise when I hit 25,000 subscribers. Well, we did that last week, and since then, which is why you guys may have noticed a drop in videos over the past 10 days, I've sorted out some merchandise for you guys. My goodness have I been excited to tell you lads about this. I mean, merchandise. My own... Oh, that is so cool. I'll make a video specifically about this, hopefully the next episode of Quality Time, if the samples arrive to me in time. But if you lads feel like picking up some merch, then head over to the Quality Store on Teespring down at the link in the description below. It's also a fantastic way to support the channel, and I'd love to see some photos if you lads do grab some on social media, so uh, feel free to at me. Anyway, on to the main topic of today's video. So far, this series we've covered potential light tank additions for Britain with the Staghound and Scorpion, the French Panhard EBR armoured cars, and the Russians with vehicles like the Jalo S or Sprit SD. Now it's time for the Americans, but seeing as this video will hopefully get a substantial number of views, I thought I'd go back over the proposed changes to armoured cars and the scouting ability that light tanks have for anybody who hasn't seen the following series so far. Of course, I have been over the changes before, so if you have seen the previous videos in the series, I'll leave a timestamp, you can skip this segment, and I do recommend that you lads go check out the rest of the series, which will be linked both in the video description and in a card on the top right hand corner of your screen. One of the focuses of this series has been getting more armoured cars into the game, and to make them more significant in-game, because I just personally find them a really interesting vehicle type. The way they have to follow roads in order to get the most out of their mobility, and the scouting role that gives them on the team. Armoured cars in game though, as a general rule, are extremely slow off-road, much slower than they should be. The purpose of this vehicle type was actually to be better at handling rough terrain than tracked counterparts. In various ways, they, they weren't faster, but they also shouldn't be much slower over average off-road terrain than a comparable tank, although sand, mud and snow will give them a lot more of a tough time. With weird vehicles having potentially buffed speed over your average War Thunder terrain, they'd be much more powerful in-game, allowing armoured cars with comparatively low firepower to still be balanced up in some pretty interesting ways. It'd also be nice to see some of the War Thunder maps reworked to allow roadways to become more viable as transport routes, as currently most maps aren't designed with roads in mind, and a lot of roadways just lead around the fringes of the map, say, which encourages spawn camping, that's bad, or they lead right through the centre of the map, which is very bad news for a vehicle like, say, an Alvis Saladin. As for the scouting ability itself, I'm going to reuse my discussion from the French armoured car video. Yes, I know it's a wee bit lazy, but if you're watching and you haven't skipped ahead, then I assume you haven't seen it anyway, and I feel like I went through my proposed changes in the best and most detailed way possible in that video, so enjoy. Firstly, I would like the active scouting targets that are then damaged or destroyed by allies to be more highly rewarded with RP and Silver Lions so that a player can adopt a purely scouting role and still earn a decent reward at the end of the match. I think for the active scouting targets alone, the reward is fine as is because if you raise that too high, then you run the risk of people simply flanking the entire map and scouting targets moving out of the enemy spawn, which is of no tactical use to the friendly team and shouldn't they be encouraged. It's kind of similar to the reward you get for just taking off or landing in an aircraft. But if the target you've scouted is damaged or destroyed, then the reward could be raised significantly to be more in line with damaging or destroying enemy vehicles yourself. Not quite as high, obviously, but maybe 80% of the reward for if you'd have done the damage yourself. Currently, if a scouted target is killed, you do get a good chunk of SL, it's around what you'd get for an assist but you get something like 50 RP, which is just not enough to make players prioritise it as a part of their playstyle, and you get zero RP for a scouted target being damaged, which frequently they can be damaged after you've scouted them, 
but not killed by friendlies until after the scouting timer runs out, meaning you get no RP at all for that. Scouting is really nothing but an added bonus for light tanks right now, just a way to gain extra RP and SL because you can get a lot of assists with your guns often not having quite the punch of a medium or heavy tank of the tier, and thanks to the airstrike modification it's also a cheap way of getting into an aircraft for close air support, which I don't necessarily agree with, I don't think that makes a lot of sense. It would make more sense if you could bail out of an undamaged vehicle without incurring a death and therefore spawn back in the tank after carrying out the airstrike. That's something I've been advocating for for quite a while, but similarly to aircraft that can J out when stationary on the runway in order to change their ordnance loadouts or what have you, and not incur a death or a repair cost, that an undamaged tank or fully repaired tank that is not in direct line of sight or close proximity to an enemy vehicle could bail out safely without dying or losing the vehicle. This makes a lot of sense at top tier. For example, if you're in your Leopard 2A5 but you need to spawn in an aircraft or an SPAA, it's gonna cost you around 25 grand to do it even if your tank is totally undamaged and there are no enemy tanks anywhere near you. That makes no sense. If aircraft can do it, tanks should be able to as well, all tanks, and allowing for this would make the airstrike modification for light tanks more sensible. The idea that the intelligence that your scouting is providing is being used to call in air support. Basically what I want though is for a good scout to be able to earn just as much SL and RP as a good medium tank player for instance, but only if his scouting is actually proving useful to the team. That's I guess what being a good scout is. This is similar to the spotting damage mechanic in World of Tanks. You can spot 15 tanks, but if nobody on your team is able to shoot at them, then you're not really earning any reward for doing it. If you are spotting the right targets, however, and being a strategic use to your team, you don't even have to fire your gun, and you'll earn just as high a reward at the end of the match. This only works, however, if the team is paying attention to the targets that you're spotting, which often, they're not. Currently, when targets are spotted, the tank becomes marked on the map for, I believe, 30 seconds, regardless of how far they move from the location they were pinged at. The tank type is revealed and a chevron appears above the tank in-game. If the scouted target is damaged or killed during this time, then the scout earns an additional reward on top of the tiny silver lion reward you get for just having scouted the target originally. Now, what I said in the last video is that rather than a chevron just appearing over the scouted tank, which often goes unnoticed, a line would be spoken over the radio, target spotted, from the same guy who says, attention to the map, or... What this does is make it far more likely that teammates will pick up on the fact that you've just given them the location of a hostile vehicle and make them far more likely to react to it, which makes scouting far more powerful. It gives the game an additional layer of tactics, especially from the point of view of a tank in a squadron with a light or scout vehicle. This is why in the last video I suggested raising the relative BRs of all vehicles with the scouting ability, and I also suggest giving that ability to the top tier tank destroyers like the Centauro, Type 16 or AMX-10 RC. This is all basically the stuff I went over in the last video, but here's the bit I really wanted to add. Number one, the range of scouting needs to be increased. I know there's the improved optics modification, but as you can see from this clip, I can't even scout these Panzer IVs, even though I'm close enough to not only tell that they're Panzer IVs, I can even tell instantly what variant of the Panzer IV these are, they're Panzer IV F2s. Crosshair pointed directly on them, press the scout key, nothing. Scouting failed. You can see this in the last episode of the series too in the T-18 Boarhound, even when closer to the targets, I still couldn't scout them, and this is with the improved optics modification. So I suggest we give scouting unlimited range but increase the sensitivity, meaning that the crosshair has to be directly on the target and they have to be in direct line of sight. No more scouting targets seconds after they've moved behind solid cover. Now, what does that mean for the improved optics module? Do we simply remove it? Well, no. I think this upgrade could be given a different purpose, that when you have it, rather than simply saying target spotted, the audio line would be, for example, enemy tank destroyer spotted at coordinate C3, like in the case of this VFW here. Basically, when you have this upgrade modification, your scouting provides the team with additional intelligence, telling them what type of tank was spotted and where they are on the map. The only problem I can see with this being that on some maps the grid coordinates are massive and that the entire enemy team could all be in the same square, that can easily be fixed, we just need to make the squares on the grid smaller. 
I also think that the Keen Vision crew skill would increase the length of time that targets are spotted for, so having it at 5 would spot the tank for 60 seconds, while having it at 0 would merely spot the tank for 10 seconds. At the same time, the awareness skill would reduce the cooldown on your scouting, because we would have to increase the base cooldown on the scouting ability, otherwise it's just going to be too much. We don't want this to turn into arcade mode after all. Well, there you have it, lads. That was my proposed changes and buffs to the scouting mechanic, and I think they would really improve the game, make it a lot more fun to play a scout role. So please let me know your thoughts down in the comment section below. What I find most interesting is that this could really change the meta of the game back to one that focuses on armor. How? Well, right now the meta consists mainly of mobility rules the roost, because everybody can easily penetrate even the heaviest of heavy tanks frontally without too much trouble. The guns of light tanks aren't comparatively all that much worse than those of mediums or even some heavies. Take the RU251 compared to the Panther II or King Tiger for example. It actually has a bigger gun with far more penetration, along with having about double the speed and equal if not better reload. Against that, well... Unless you have 300mm of armour, you effectively don't have any armour at all. Really, only an M103 can stand up to it. But with the scouting ability being buffed significantly to make it more useful to the team, and therefore more likely to yield results based on the sharing of intelligence, something I really think War Thunder could use, as for all its pros, it lacks the team-based gameplay mechanics of World of Tanks. And scouting also granting more lucrative rewards... Tanks and armoured cars with the scouting ability would all go up in battle rating. This goes double if maps are slightly redesigned in order to promote travelling by roads, allowing armoured cars to get into some pretty good overwatch positions, from which they can provide ample intelligence for the friendly team. Because of that, these vehicles are going to have some fairly subpar guns for their tier. Their strengths would lie outside of firepower meaning that against them, the armour of your heavy tanks will be really reliable. Even some medium tanks like Sherman's or M48's, for example, will have some good, worthwhile armour. So keep that in mind when I suggest battle ratings for today's vehicles, and let's get right into them. At first, I have a few vehicles to skim through, the T-13, T-17 Deerhound and M8 Greyhound. These are all armoured cars, or should I say unarmoured cars, with the 37mm M6 gun, which can be found on the M3A1 and M5 Stuart models. This means just under 80mm max penetration. The T-13 was the first armoured car designed by the United States during World War II, has 8 wheels and can go up to 72km per hour. I would suggest it be placed at a battle rating 1.3 to maybe 1.7. The T-17 Deerhound, once again 6 wheels and the same gun, but an increased speed over 95 km per hour, which would make it very fun for perhaps 2.0 to even 2.3 given that speed. It was originally developed for use by the British, but was rejected in favour of Chevrolet's T-17E Staghound, which I very purposely left off this list, all of its many variants. I suggested them all in the British video, so if you want to know more about them, then go check that out. But with the T-17 and the M8 Greyhound, as well as the T-18 Boarhound, the event vehicle, I see no reason why America needs the T-17E Staghound as well, and it would be nice for the Brits, who have been unfairly lacking light tanks and scout tanks since their introduction, to get a lot of unique light vehicles in one big patch. Of course, I am biased though. Thirdly, the M8 Greyhound. I think it kind of sucks that a vehicle as historically significant as the M8 is locked off as an event vehicle. Premium, sure, but not an event reward. I don't like that. I spoke in the British video about replacing the event reward AEC with a Staghound variant that featured the same gun, so that the British tech tree was made up more of British vehicles than US designed ones, and I think the same could be done here. The event M8 could be replaced by the T21, a very similar armoured car, 6 wheels and the same 88km per hour top speed, and actually it looks almost identical to the M8 along with having nearly identical performance. This was just a prototype design as problems with the transmission caused it to be scrapped, and the T22 prototype, which later became the M8 Greyhound, was selected for production instead. This makes the vehicle perfect for the role of an event reward in my opinion, and frees up the M8 Greyhound, a vehicle with huge historical significance, to be added into the regular tech tree for all players to play. Next up is... <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> what a stupid... <clears throat> I mean, what an interesting looking vehicle. <laughs> Seriously, this thing looks hilarious. How this was ever produced, I don't even know. 
that this is the M38 Chaffee. The M38 Wolfhound was another six-wheeled armoured car armed with the 37mm M6 gun. Jeez, America loved that thing. It was designed as a potential replacement for the M8, and it did feature the same top speed as the T17 Deerhound, 97 km per hour. So perhaps it should replace the M8 as the event reward, and wouldn't it just be so gaijin to make the limited edition vehicle just a wee bit better than its regular tech tree counterpart? But with that top speed, it might sit a wee bit too high in the battle ratings. But what I do want to suggest for the regular tech tree is a Wolfhound variant with the turret of an M24 Chaffee. This vehicle in War Thunder would possibly go up as high as battle rating 4.0. Remember that wheeled vehicles and the scouting mechanic have been noticeably buffed, and a vehicle like this will be hoping for side shots anyway, so it doesn't need too much penetration if it needs to fire its main gun at all. The M24 itself would probably go up to 3.7 or even 4.0 with this vehicle going up to 4.3. I think that would make playing, say, KV-85s and T-34-57s very interesting. Now, a similar vehicle, the T-66, which was another six-wheeled armoured car armed with the 75mm gun, but I think this one looks a lot nicer. Either of these could also be made a premium. Up next is our first tracked vehicle on this list, the T-88, which is an M18 Hellcat armed with the same 105mm howitzer as the M4A3-105, at battle rating 2.7. This tank would likely sit in the tank destroyer line preceding the M18, and I don't think it would get scouting because of this. I'm actually not sure what BR this tank would have. See, with only the same shells as the M4105, the tank could make a very good maybe 3.3. That gun stops packing so much of a punch at any higher battle rating, and the reload is quite long. But this gun could also fire an APDS round, which I couldn't find any data regarding penetration, but I would suggest that with this shell, the tank would sit at perhaps battle rating 4.7 to even 5.0, a good support for the Jumbo Sherman and M4A276. Other than that gun, it's a Hellcat, so up to 80 km per hour with that radial engine. Our next vehicle is similar to a Russian one that I brought up in the last video. This is the T55E1 gun motor carriage, an eight-wheeled anti-tank vehicle capable of 80 km per hour with a fixed three-inch gun. This prototype was only built once and was then cancelled, so potentially this could be an interesting premium, but it'd make a very interesting vehicle for, once again, 4.7 or even 5.0, because even though this one is wheeled, I once again doubt it would get the scouting ability. I still thought, due to its being a wheeled vehicle, that it was worth bringing up on this list. Next up is a vehicle I've been advocating for for years. The M41A1 Walker Bulldog, a battle rating 6.0, is one of my favourite tanks in the game. Definitely my favourite light tank, and honestly, I've suggested in the past that it's good enough to go up to battle rating 6.3. So with the changes to scouting, it would make for a good 6.7. Folded in with the M41A1 would be our next tank, the upgraded M41A3. This variant included a more powerful engine and better transmission, giving it an improved top speed of 80 km per hour and more notably better off-road speed and acceleration, as well as a faster torque traverse around 32 degrees per second if memory serves, which is blisteringly quick. I think this vehicle could sit one step above the A1 in a bracket at 7.0, but the main reason I like the idea of this tank being added is that with these upgrades, even though each one is not all that significant, the vehicle will be capable of assuming a totally different playstyle, that of a more aggressive scout. With its much faster reaction time, given that it can accelerate much more quickly, twitch back and forth baiting enemies into firing, and then swing the turret around much faster, the M41A3 would be much more optimised for a close quarters, urban environment, scouting and life support role. It's that kind of nuance to similar vehicles that's had me really enjoying World of Tanks and World of Warships. Now, I know as a War Thunder player I'm forbidden on pain of death from enjoying World of Tanks, but let's say for example you see a Panhard EBR on your team being a passive scout, you can tell instantly that that player doesn't really know what he's doing. That vehicle is extremely mobile, but has a very short view range. It has to be used in a more active scouting role. A Chinese Type 64, on the other hand, is more of a passive scout due to its superior view range, and it does have a good enough gun to be used as a, a real anti-tank vehicle. Those obvious differences in playstyle that come from just one parameter, but completely change your experience playing the vehicle, I love that. 
Also, speaking of Chinese tanks like the Type 64, the M41D, another variant of the Walker Bulldog, would be likely to come to a potential Chinese tech tree. I keep seeming to bring that up. Well, we've been going for a while and we haven't even gotten to high tier stuff yet. Let's keep going. The V150, an armoured car very similar to the Italian AUBL74. This four-wheeled car mounted the same 90mm cockerel gun as the Orbel, although it did also mount a Mekar 90mm gun and the British 76mm L23A1 gun seen on the Scorpion and Saladin. So there is the possibility that we get two variants of this tank, one with the 76mm and one with either of the 90mm. I'd go with the Cockerel gun since the Scorpion 90 and Saladin also both used it, I suggested both of those in the British video, and it's already in game. I'm not sure about giving it the 76mm, I think it'd be nice once again for Britain to have that bit of uniqueness, but it could always come in as a US premium. This tank did see service in the Vietnam conflict under the designation M706, and as many as 10,000 were produced for export, with a huge variety of armaments, including 20mm autocannons. This would make for a good 7.7 .7 in my opinion. The AUBL-74 would also go up there, while the existing 6.7 light tanks in the US tech tree would likely go up to 7.3, maybe 7.0 for the T-92. Next up are two very interesting light tanks. Firstly, the HSTVL, or the High Survivability Test Vehicle, the L standing for lightweight. This is essentially a cross between a T-92 and a Big Light Panzer, which seems like a whole bunch of bullshit, but let me explain. The HSTV was designed in the late 70s as a lightweight, low silhouette tank that could be airdropped and would still retain an advanced fire control system and even hunter-killer technology, gun stabilization system and the ability to gun down enemy tanks. The vehicle was fitted with the XM274 Ares heavy autocannon, which is a 75mm smoothbore rapid-firing gun capable of pumping out one round every second. So think the fire rate of the Warrior, and it held as many as 26 four-shot clips. These shells have equal penetrative power to the Abrams M774 DU APFSDS shell, and the fire control system of this vehicle also allowed it to engage low-speed aircraft and helicopters. That is just scary. Think of this tank as an American automatic without radar, but with a silhouette similar in size to a T-92, or in other words, a very small bagel panzer without ATGMs, but with a gun that fires APFSDS rounds equivalent to those of an Abrams. Combine that with an 85 km per hour top speed, an unmanned turret, which means that hull down you can't even damage the thing, and that fire rate, and you've got yourself one scary ass vehicle. This tank would easily come in at 9.3 in my opinion. Sharing that gun is the RDF LT, which stands for Rapid Deployment Force Light Tank. And no, <laughs> no, 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 screw this, no way. This tank would be utterly terrifying, let me tell you. With that same one round per second fire rate and the same 75mm round equivalent to the M774, the RDF LT is another prototype for an extremely low silhouette tank able to support main battle tanks and be much more mobile. Once again, this vehicle could be airdropped quite easily. This tank, however, features an extremely unique design, with that 75mm Ares cannon, that is a sick name by the way, fitted on a telescopic mounting that allows for some pretty crazy gunnery angles, and for the tank to sit completely behind cover, raising the gun up, utilising that autoloader, and effectively remaining unhittable. This is similar to the M901 Wally ATGM launcher we already see in-game. This is like the final form of an unmanned turret. I'll put up some images of the gunnery angles this thing can achieve thanks to the telescopic gun arm, and I don't even think I have to tell you how dangerous that could prove in War Thunder. Yep, this would be a 9.7 vehicle. Once again, think of an automatic in the anti-tank role, but you can't even hit this one. <laughs> The AGS Stingray light tank. This is one I'm sure a lot of you expected to see on this list. Essentially a 1980s equivalent to the Walker Bulldog, something air transportable but with the gun of an equivalent MBT, the Stingray was actually originally prototyped with the turret on the hull of an M41. Later prototypes saw the turret placed onto an M551 Sheridan hull, and the final production model vehicle is similar to the Sheridan-based prototype. 
Essentially, we have a 105mm rifled cannon, three guesses which one, and a turret that looks remarkably similar to that of the Type 16 now that I look at it. Maybe a wee bit chonkier. It would be likely to fire the same rounds as the M60A1 Rise, possibly using the M774, I'm not 100% certain, but this tank could go 70 km per hour and with that round would easily be a 9.0 vehicle. Over 100 Stingrays have been produced, although I don't believe they were ever used by the US. This same turret was actually placed on a wheeled vehicle too, and this is our equivalent to the Centauro Romor, the Type 16, etc which, with scouting, would both go up to 9.7. The LAV 600 is a six-wheeled tank destroyer capable of 100 km per hour, mounting that same Stingray turret and same 105mm gun. This vehicle is completely unrelated to the Canadian LAV, but is a follow-up to the earlier American LAV 300, which featured a 90mm gun. I believe it's that same Cockerel gun we already know. Both of these tanks could come in, the LAV-300 at possibly 8.0 after the V-150. Remember that the early B-1 Centauro without the APFSDS round, but with a 105mm gun, would go up to perhaps 8.3 or 8.7. While the LAV-600 or LAV-600 could come into the game at the same 9.7 battle rating as the existing top tier TDs. Now for the tank that beat out the Stingray however, but still never went into mass production. The M8 Buford AGS or Armoured Gun System. A competing design for a main battle tank era light air transportable tank providing fire support to much more heavily armoured MBTs, the M8 AGS was designed to replace the Sheridan and once again featured a 105mm rifled gun which would fire the same rounds as the Stingray and Abrams. The tank could travel at 72 km per hour and would come in at 9.0 in my opinion due to an unremarkable speed for main battle tank era in War Thunder and obviously no armour. That's XM1 battle rating remember and the XM1 is faster and better armoured. The benefit to this tank would be increased firepower and the scouting ability. What you need to understand is that not only are tanks difficult to deploy to a region like, for example, the Middle East, just given logistics, they're also confined in their versatility in real life far more than they are in War Thunder. They have bridges and other impassable locations, can be difficult to traverse over rough terrain, while in War Thunder 65 ton MBTs just casually bounce off of rocks perfectly fine. MBTs are honestly quite fragile, which is what makes them a logistical nightmare compared to a light, air transportable vehicle that can fulfil the same fire support role. That's why tanks like the LAV Striker are so popular today. Before that though, the US created an absolute ton of these light tank prototype vehicles that were meant to match main battle tanks in their firepower department, but be a lot easier to use while on the battlefield, while obviously needing to sacrifice armour protection. Unfortunately though, very few of them actually worked out, and the M8 AGS was cancelled in 1997, the year I was born, hooray! We're almost done now, this one will be real quick, the M3A3 Bradley. This is a vehicle I would absolutely love, I've even suggested it before. It's the familiar M3 Bradley, but with some noticeable upgrades in firepower and protection, which along with the buff to scouting, would put this tank at probably BR 9.7. The upgrades themselves? will replace the existing APDS rounds with the M919 depleted uranium 25mm APFSDS which doubled the penetration, that's 200mm, enough to punch right through the side of any Russian tank out to a mile away and some pretty good angled penetration too at close range, along with the tow anti-tank missiles being replaced with tow 2As, which are tandem warheads that can penetrate up to 900mm these are the mid-tier missiles for the AH-1Z Viper unlocked before the Hellfires. Along with that, we add some explosive reactive armour, and you're looking at one bloody powerful IFV, or CFV should I say, the M2 is the infantry support, while the M3 Bradley is known as a cavalry fighting vehicle. I just know someone will get mad if I don't specify that. Now for the one you've all been waiting for, the M1128 Striker Mobile Gun System. Oh boy, this is shaping up to be a real long video. If the 8-wheeled 105mm tank destroyers are the top TDs of the game, then this would be the best of the best. This vehicle could come into the game right now in tier 7, but with my proposals to buff scouting and giving that ability to these tank destroyers, the M1128 would have to come well above 10.0. Having said that, we of course still have our tier 7 tanks sitting at their placeholder 10.0 battle rating. 
Seriously, I've just about given up hoping that Gaijin will ever buck up their ideas and fix that, but let's just say that our top tier is raised up to, say, 11.0 with the Leopard 2A5 and Leclerc, and the M1A1 HA and T90A come in at that battery rating too to match. You lads have heard me go through all this before, I don't need to do it again. The M1128 Striker would then sit very nicely at battery rating 10.7 or even 11.0. And even currently without the scouting ability, it really would be a 10.3 capable vehicle, equal to say, the Challenger 2. This is another tank with an unmanned turret and features the M68A2 105mm rifled gun, which is an upgraded form of the gun seen on the early Abrams models. The thing is though, this tank fires not only the M833 round all Abrams fanboys have been lusting over, but the even more powerful M900, which is capable of around 510 to 530 millimeters flat penetration at point blank range. Once again, the selling point of this vehicle is going to be the ability to position it in such a way that you can fire at enemies without being hittable in return, at least not being killable. And the speed and mobility of this tank, like that of the Centauro Romor, Type 16, the Vickers Viper, for example, this will be a hell of a vehicle. This is one many players have been asking for already, in fact a lot of you lads have asked me to talk about this one, and I really do believe it will come soon. Its off-road speed is fantastic for a wheeled vehicle, actually known to be better than that of the Abrams, but whether we'd see that represented in War Thunder is anyone's guess. The main issue with this tank is the recoil. This is a very light vehicle firing a very powerful gun, and the recoil means that the turret can't be traversed a full 360 degrees, it wouldn't be safe to fire at those angles. I'm not certain of its exact limits, but compare it to say the British FV 4005. The recoil can also make things pretty painful for the gunners of these vehicles I've heard, with the vehicle rocking to such a degree that the sights come up and smack you in the face. Anyway, the M1128 MGS Striker, an amazing potential vehicle, exceedingly powerful, something I cannot wait to play. I think it may be on the horizon for us in War Thunder, and if slash when it does come, I am going to be a very happy boy. Anyway lads, that is going to do us for this video. I think that's enough, don't you? If you're still here, chuck us a fat AMX56 in the comments. Yeah, I'm leaning into it now. Now, of course, none of these vehicles are confirmed, none of the changes to the scouting either. This vehicle is purely a hypothetical meant to create discussion and have fun thinking about the potential future of this game when it comes to, well, this specific part, light, scout tanks and support vehicles. Of course, we went over a lot of options, it's probably unnecessary that we get them all, but once again, this video is just meant for entertainment and getting those ideas out there in the first place, so that maybe some discussion is created and Gaijin sees it as worthwhile adding some of them in. With that being said, I did stress in the British video that I would like to see in one single patch Britain getting a whole line of light tanks, all if not most of the ones from that video, and that could be the theme of that patch, just like our most recent one was the Japanese Navy, 1.85 was supersonic jets along with the whole Italian ground forces tree. I think one patch where Britain gets a whole new line would be awesome to see, and would do Gaijin a lot of good, British players would have some very nice new vehicles, and the uniqueness would convince a lot of people to jump in and begin grinding the whole new line, buying some premiums along the way. Other nations like America or Russia could get their own new light tanks drip fed throughout the patches, there's no need to make them the focal point of an update. But Germany is also in need of some tech tree light vehicles, which we will go over in the next and final episode of this series. I'd also love it if you'd let me know your thoughts on my proposed overhauling of the light tank scout mechanic, and if you support that being added into the game, then be sure to create some discussion around it, share the video, get talking, and Gaijin will be far more likely to consider working it into the game. I really hope you lads have enjoyed this video, and that if you did, you leave a like and subscribe to the channel, hit that bell icon, join the 360 squad, boy I need a 360 squad t-shirt. Make sure you check out the merch store, the Koality store on Teespring. Lads, I have been so excited about my channel one day reaching the point where I'd have my own merchandise, and now that we're here, I could not be happier. It's a huge support for the channel if you do pick something up, and I'd love to see you guys on social media if you do decide to. Come follow me on Twitter and Twitch, join the Discord, and check out Patreon, or join up here on YouTube if you wish to support the channel further, links are all down in the description below. Thank you lads all so much for watching, have a lovely good day, and always remember, keep your bagpipes to hand, your kilt on, and I shall see you next video. I say we thank you to these lads for supporting me on Patreon.
Captain Fubar, D8261, Geesley Gadarsen, and Dark Recon. You lads are bra. If you wish to join them, come check out the link in the description below.